Uhuru comrades, and welcome to today's O'Malley Taught Me Sunday Study featuring Chairman O'Malley Eshetela. My name is Makeda, and I'm a member of the International People's Democratic Uhuru Movement under the leadership of International President Kolumbai and Annette, and I'll be your MC this morning. Today's study is a continuation of a special series where the chairman takes us through each chapter of the political report to the 7th Congress. This week, the chairman will be reading part two of chapter nine titled, African Internationalism. As stated last week, this chapter can also be found in the chairman's book, An Uneasy Equilibrium, breaking down the theory of African internationalism, the revolutionary scientific theory developed by Chairman O'Malley Eshetela himself. What we'll learn from this chapter is that African internationalism is the theory of African of the African working class and is one that has been tested and proven out in the real world. It is this theory that has allowed the African People's Socialist Party to solve the fundamental problems of the African Revolution. African internationalism is the worldview of the party and the increasingly adopted worldview of the peoples of the planet Earth, looking for a future absent of imperialism, colonialism, and parasitic capitalism. The chairman will read the second half of chapter nine, and then we'll open it up for questions and answers, where you will have an opportunity to comment and ask questions pertaining to this chapter specifically. We ask you to write your questions as you think of them so that we are able to start reading them following the reading. We also encourage that when you comment your question, you state your location for us so we can gauge where everyone is watching from. It is now my honor to introduce the African, the leader of the African nation, the founder of this profound revolutionary theory, Chairman O'Malley Yeshitela. born in disrepute of the rapes, massacres, occupations, genocides, colonialism, and every despicable act humans are capable of inflicting. Capitalism was not responsible for some great otherwise unimaginable leap in production, which despite its contradictions resulted in human progress and enlightenment. What capitalism did was to rip the vast majority of humanity out of the productive process. In Africa, Asia, the Middle East, Australia, and what has come to be known as the Americas. The hundreds of millions dead due to the slave trade and slavery itself. The millions exterminated everywhere Europeans ventured. These are people whose hands were forever removed from a relationship with nature that would result in production. Europeans achieve their national identity by way of this bloody process. This is not something that only happened a long time ago. The world's people are suffering the consequence of capitalism emergence right now. Locked in colonies and the indirect rule of neo-colonialism restricted to lives characterized by brutality, ignorance, and violence in the barrios of the Americas and in other internal colonies characterized as Indian reservations and black ghettos kept under the paranoid nuclear-backed armed to the teeth watch of a military force born of a state power that has as its genesis, that has as its origin in protecting the relationship between capitalism and the imperialist pedestal Capitalism has been the absolute factor in restricting our production and development. It has concentrated productive capacity in the hands of the world minority European population that sits atop the pedestal of our oppressive reality. Capitalism was not the good so-called progressive force that is the precursor to something better for humanity. Capitalism was a disaster that rescued Europe from a diseased, feudal existence at the expense of the Africans and the rest of the world. In the 17th century, Galileo, an Ita Ita Italian scientist, ran afoul of the Catholic Church, 
with his claim that the earth circumnavigated the sun, <coughs> as opposed to the prevailing view in feudal Europe supported by the church that the earth was the center of the universe. The white left has always been locked in a worldview that places the location of Europeans at the center of the universe. If this were not the case, Marx would have been forced to declare that the road to socialism is painted black, <coughs> the destruction of the pedestal upon which all capitalist activity occurs, not some maturation of contradictions within European capitalist society resting upon the pedestal is the key to overturning imperialist capitalism. I just wanted to make this statement uh, because this is something that's argued even today. You will hear people talking about uh, magnificence of capitalism. Despite the fact that it has these problems, et cetera, et cetera, it has resulted in this great leap in productivity that never would have occurred without the emergence of capitalism. And this is a really arrogant uh, statement that liquidates the significance of every other human, uh, everybody on earth except white people. Uh, because what it means is that these millions of people who died in the slave trade, who died as a consequence of, of, of invasions, rape, plunder, the theft of all their resources, it liquidates any possibility that all these people would have done anything that would have brought wealth and resources to the world. What we're saying is that capitalism, which came into existence through rape, through slavery, through all of this, through colonization and murder, whole peoples don't exist anymore. Yet, this is what we say, we're saying that capitalism resulted in pro productivity. What is, in, what is productivity? What is economic development? What is economic growth except the consequences of human beings laying their hands to nature and transforming nature to serve our benefit. So all of these people were not able to participate in production as a consequence of what Europe did to us. So this is what we're saying. This is the bogus statement. It is a ridiculous statement uh, and one that African internationalism rejects uh, entirely. In an earlier work titled The Poverty of Philosophy, Marx made this startling admission, and I'm quoting, direct slavery is just as much the pivot of bourgeois industry as machinery, credits, etc. Without slavery, you have no cotton. Without cotton, you have no modern industry. It is slavery that gave the colonies their value. It is the colonies that created world trade, and it is world trade that is the precondition of large-scale industry. Without slavery, North America, the most progressive of countries, would be transformed into a patriarchal country. Wipe North America off the map of the world and you will have anarchy. The complete decay of modern commerce and civilization caused slavery to disappear and you will have wiped America off the map of nations. Isn't that an incredible statement? So, the foundation of the whole capitalist system has been the enslavement of African people. What an excellent formula for the overthrow of capitalism. The slavery of today is comprised of the colonial subject and oppressed peoples of the world. The existence of our party and the convening of our then sixth Congress are part of the trajectory to cause Marx to cause slavery to disappear and objectively to achieve the consequence predicted by Marx. African internationalism has brought us to a different understanding than that held by Marx and Lenin regarding the way forward in the struggle against capitalism. It is rooted in our recognition supported by quotes from Marx above that it was imperialism that gave birth to capitalism and not the other way around. Lenin stated, and this is an important thing, we will get to deal with that a little more, uh, because it has been Lenin who put forth that, capitalist, that imper the cap imperialism was capitalism developed to a high stage. Uh, we disagree with that. Lenin stated that imperialism is capitalism that is characterized in part by parasitism. But from what we have already seen from the pen of Marx and what we know from our own experiences, and historical investigation, capitalism was born parasitic. 
That is the meaning of the enslavement, colonization, and annexation of other countries and peoples by Europe. So clearly when, when Lenin says that, that imperialism is capitalism that has become parasitic, he's speaking from an entirely different perspective, a reality than that uh, those of us who have experienced the parasite much earlier than what it, when it was recognized as, as Europe, when this concept was recognized as Europe. A direct line of connection, a unity of opposites, a dialectical relationship exists between the vast majority of the planet and Europe and Europeans. There is no other explanation for the vast differences in the conditions of existence of Europeans and the rest of us. The original peoples of the Americas, Australia, Canada, the Caribbean, much of Asia, the Middle East, and everywhere the U.S. and Europe are currently engaged in bloody wars and intrigues represent what Marx had objectified with the term primitive accumulation. Indeed, the current irreversible crisis of imperialism is the result of the imperialist pedestal, the very foundation of capitalism freeing itself from its supporting role of the capitalist edifice. Objectively, this is the meaning of Afghanistan, Iraq, Palestine, Venezuela, Bolivia, and other countries where the people are attempting to liberate themselves from the yoke of empire. It is in self-defense that the U.S. and its partners are engaged in every effort, no matter how brutal or duplicitous, to protect the capitalist status quo. This is the meaning of AFRICOM, the U.S. military project created to ensnare the entire African continent in the, in the permanent embrace of U.S. Imperialist domi imperial domination to the exclusion of other avaricious imperialist contenders and African people ourselves. The future of capitalism also rests on the continued subjugation of Mexicans and indigenous people within current U.S. borders and especially of internally colonized Africans whose conditions of existence demand a permanent state of often spontaneous and unorganized but ever-present resistance. I'm pausing because if, if, if we reflect on it that our communities Africans, Mexicans, the indigenous peoples who are here are always under siege. And they're always under siege because there's always resistance. Because you can't take a people's land from them and leave them alive. You can't kidnap a people and drag them across the, pl the planet at gunpoint and then at gunpoint work them to, to nearly to death and then keep them in a state of dest destitution uh, without resistance. And because the resistance is always there, uh, the arm of the state uh, is one that is defined in part by its ongoing need to suppress that population. And this suppression is reflected uh, in laws that get created to keep the oppressed oppressed. And uh, we've talked about this before in terms of how law and, and various customs uh, uh, simply reflect a superstructure based uh, on an economic base, uh, and whatever that economic base is, a superstructure uh, responds to that, and that includes laws. And so they have laws now. There are laws that are designed to maintain the status quo, to maintain the permanence of the existing uh, economic uh, system. And that economic system is based on slavery, based on theft of resources, lands, uh, subjugation of whole peoples. This is the foundation upon which uh, all of the capitalist, uh, uh, capitalism uh, rests. And uh, so when we look at, at you know, preachers and politicians, I'm talking about even in the African community, who are constantly are complaining about lawbreakers and et cetera, they're complaining about an ongoing kind of resistance that must necessarily exist in among the colonized peoples, even if it's misdirected resistance, even if it's uninformed resistance. Because it is misdirected and because it is uninformed, 
uh, there must be an African People's Socialist Party to give definition and to inform that resistance, to create tactics and strategies to uh, put forth uh, 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 an assessment, a scientifically based assessment of what the contradiction is and what it is that we have to do to get out of the circumstances we're confronted with. That's why we are moving toward the Seventh Congress, the most critical uh, seventh, con the most critical Congress that we've ever done, and the most e eventful uh, uh, occurrence that's happened since uh, the Garvey movement uh, in its heyday. The enduring impact of Marx's theory is the fact that it was a response to a, a desperately needed explanation of the world and the way forward during a time when the thousand year reign of European feudalism was colliding with the emergence of capitalism. A time when the existing European superstructure was incapable of representing the transforming economic base of society. The established political, legal, and cultural institutions and philosophy were incapable of representing the emerging capitalist social system that was ruthlessly uprooting feudalism. The similarity to today's world is obvious to African internationalists. Confusion abounds in every arena. Prior explanations fail to satisfy the test of reality. The U.S. popular culture is replete with examples of decadence and philosophical inadequacy. The most oft viewed movies and TV shows in the U.S. include those of white superheroes, mostly from a past era of imperialist strength, and ghoulish vampires and zombies of today. In other words, one is offered a thrill of nostalgic, various super strength uh, reflecting the, I'm sorry, in other words, one is offered a thrill of, vica of, of nostalgic, vica vicarious, super strength reflecting the imperialist past or the walking dead, representative of the imperialist socio-political purgatory of today, a superstructure resting on the shaky foundation of a terminally ill imperialism is incapable of seeing the future. It can't see the future. And in the same way, anybody who's ever had to deal with hospice understand that a hospice victim can't see the future. And this is what imperialism is. It's in hospice. And, and if it cannot see the future. Noah Buchanan and Brzezinski, the only ones confused by how imperialist crisis expresses itself today. The special 90th anniversary issue of Foreign Affairs, the political journal of the Council of Foreign Relations, a bourgeois entity historically associated with the Trilateral Commission uh, and the Rockefellers, is dedicated to scrambling for an ideological grasp of this era of imperialism and crisis. This, this was the special 90th anniversary issue. The January-February 2012 anniversary issue title is titled The Clash of Ideas, the Ideological Battles that Made the Modern World and Will Shape the Future. This is the title. Among the submissions to this journal is one by Francis Fukuyama with the implosion of the Soviet Union and the capitulation of China to the capitalist model, Fukuyama popularized the term end of history to suggest the U.S. Western imperialism model represents the extent to which human society would develop. What an arrogance. <laughs> what an arrogance. Today, Fukuyama is one of the many who have had to reconsider outdated notions of imperialist permanency. In his submission to foreign affairs, the future of history, this is what his submission was, the future of history, Fukuyama is now advancing a modified, outdated defense of imperialism, in which he asked the question in the subtitle, can liberal democracy survive the decline of the middle class? Interesting, interestingly, Fukuyama addresses what is for him one of the most puzzling future features 
of the world in the aftermath of the financial crisis. The fact that so far, uh, the fact, as he puts it, that, quote unquote, so far populism has taken primarily a right-wing form, not a left-wing one. This is Trumpism and stuff like that. This is the populism that he's talking about is responding to the financial crisis that's happened in the United States, and that's startling to him. Uh, Fukuyama continues, quote, the main trend in left-wing thought in the last two generations have been frankly disastrous as either conceptual frameworks or tools for mobilization. Marxism died many years ago, and the few old believers still around are ready for nursing homes. The academic left replaced it with postmodernism, multiculturalism, feminism, critical theory, and a host of other fragmented intellectual trends that are more cultural than economic in focus. This is what Fukuyama had to say, unquote. The 41-year history of the African People's Socialist Party is clear evidence that history did not end. In anticipation of Fukuyama's current intellectual dilemma, the main resolution of our first Congress held in Oakland, California, all the way back in 1981, laid out direction and leadership for our struggle. struggle. Its revealing title is A New Beginning, The Road to Black Freedom and Socialism. Indeed, Fukuyama's end is our beginning. The Six-Party Congress and the theory of African internationalism represent the future of history that Fukuyama is reaching for. The emphasis on African internationalist theory in this political report to the Congress is a refutation of Fukuyama's outdated assumptions. The slave, previously brutalized into silence, has found a voice, and we do understand the world and the future. Our six-party Congress is living testimony to that reality. We are not the so-called left that Fukuyama speaks of. We are not some radical, loyal opposition. We are African internationalists committed to the overthrow of the entire system of empire that has feasted off the blood and resources of Africans and others around the world. We are the African People's Socialist Party that survived the war without terms unleashed against our revolution of the 60s. Indeed, what is reflected in the popular culture of vampires and geriatric superheroes is the end of history that Fukuyama presumed to see with the failure of the Soviet Union. Were it not for the seriousness of the occasion of our Sixth Congress, we would be tempted here to say to Fukuyama, not without some element of smug, smug satisfaction, be careful what you wish for. It is the liberty of the oppressed, the colonized, and enslaved laboring masses of the world currently involved in a massive attempted jailbreak that will destroy capitalism, the prevailing dominant social system that has the world in lockdown. Therefore, the crisis of a capitalism does not cause us anxiety. We know that it, this is the crisis of the parasite that has, since its hist historical emergence, required the lives and resources of Africans and others for success and survival. While this is not a new position of our party, Confusion on this question has led to profound errors within the African liberation and socialist movements. Israel led to e Africa, the 1990 political report to the third Congress of our party attempted to bring clarity and leadership to this crucial issue. In that report, we stated, and I quote, we have always said that those who saw the fundamental struggle in the world as existing between the minority white workers and bosses of the world were mistaken. We have always said that the essential class struggle in the world does not exist between the white workers and the white ruling class, but is actually concentrated in the struggle against colonialism and economic dependency. Indeed, whether he knew it or not, Marx inferred as much himself when in part Seven, eight of capital, he wrote in a quote that we find so important that we use it for the third time in this current report, quote, in fact, the veiled slavery of the wage worker in Europe 
needed for its pedestal, slavery pure and simple in the new world. This statement by Marx is simply another way of saying that capitalism, the entire basis and superstructure of white power as it exists, has its origin in and rests upon a pedestal of African oppression. This point is further elaborated in Israel Le to E Africa, quoting, the significance of this research is its usefulness in exposing that the fundamental contradiction, the resolution of which would result in the historically based advent of socialism, has never existed between the industrial white working class and ruling class. The real focus of the class contra contradiction in the real world exists in the contest between, the, between capitalism born as a world system and the pedestal upon which it rests. Hence, the 1917 revolution in Russia was not a true socialist revolution since the real historical basis of socialism, which is the destruction of the pedestal upon which capitalism rests and which is required for its existence, had not occurred. What happened in Russia in 1917 was the emergence of conditions that constituted the political basis for socialists to seize power. That's different. The historical basis for, the, for socialism did not exist. What existed was the political conditions for socialists to seize power. Do you see? Anyway, if you listen to Marx, who says that, that uh, the whole capitalist uh, thing rests upon the foundation of slavery and colonialism, then it becomes clear that that had not occurred, that this pedestal had not been destroyed. And what had happened is on top of this pedestal, uh, you had a fight between contending forces for control of the resources and political power. However, this, this siege of state power by socialists did not change the reality that the world economy, even the world economy within which Russia existed, was and continues to be a capitalist world economy. It is the same world economy created by the slave trade and augmented by other facets of parasitic or primitive accumulation that transform the vast majority of the peoples and countries of the world into great reservoirs of human and material resources largely for European and North American exploitation." Unquote. This is why the presence of our party is so important. We are the living custodians of the history of struggle and the political, ideological, and organizational bridge from the last era of struggle up to now. We are the organizations whose very action, whose every action, is guided by our political theory and whose political theory always has been tested and deepened by our action. Many of the African liberation organizations of the past period no longer exist, and most that do have lost all semblance of revolutionary content. Though some forces act as if the Black Panther Party still exists, there has been no functioning Black Panther Party in the U.S. for nearly 40 years. The race nationalist hybrid that calls itself the new Black Panther Party has absolutely nothing in common with the Black Panther Party of the 1960s except for appropriating the name and the fact that its members wear berets. The new Black Panther Party is a caricature of the original Black Panther Party whose founding was tied to the historical process in which the questions of class struggle and nonviolence were being hotly debated throughout the African liberation movement in the U.S. and by diverse liberation movements in contest with colonialism and their own petty bourgeoisie around the world. Unlike the new Black Panther Party, the original Black Panther Party was not a race nationalist organization that perceived a race-based society locked in a Manichaean battle between evil whites and good blacks. And while for much of its short, effective existence, the Black Panther Party was ideologically eclectic, it was, unlike the new Black Panther Party, never religiously based and almost always consistently socialist. Today, some form forces formerly associated with the original Black Panther Party consider themselves a kind of post-revolutionary alumni functioning primarily as guardians and beneficiaries of the legacy of the long-dead entity. For them, the struggle is over. 
through their actions, they have either declared victory or conceded defeat. The original nation of Islam, which the world came to know, uh, through which the world came to know Malcolm X, does not exist. The original organization was, in fact, uh, slipping into revolutionary irrelevancy despite the best efforts of Malcolm X when he split with the organization prior to his assassination. Philosophical idealism, which prohibited the organization from actively engaging in political life during the heat of the African liberation movement of the 1960s, was one of the factors leading to Malcolm X's departure from the Nation of Islam. Malcolm's continuous move into secular politics embracing some of the civil rights activists and offering scientific, revolutionary an analysis for the re most important events of his time, endeared him to Africans and oppressed peoples throughout the world. At the same time, it created friction between him and leaders of the Nation of Islam, who thought Malcolm was straying too far from the religious idealism around which much of the Nation of Islam was defined. Even so, the leader of the existing nation of Islam rides the coattails of Malcolm X's legacy. It was Malcolm X who, to his personal detriment, raised the nation of Islam from relative obscurity as a religious organization to the most influential black nationalist political organization of that era. It was Malcolm X who gave revolutionary legitimacy to the nation of Islam in a period when the oppressed of the world sought revolutionary direction for ending the colonial domination of Africans and the world's oppressed. The provisional government of the Republic of New Africa, the RNA, was an organization that from its inception in 1968 considered itself the political heir to Malcolm X. The RNA was a militant organization that, tied, that held up the principle of self-determination that included a real struggle to capture five geographically contiguous states in the southern, U southern U.S. as a national homeland for Africans whom the RNA called New Africans. The RNA experienced years of U.S. government repression. This included military assaults uh, on their meetings and headquarters and jailings of their members and leaders. While the organization continues to exist, it appears to be merely a shell of its earlier self, despite the ongoing political act activism of some militants that continue to identify with the organization's aims. Of the civil rights organization of the era, only the NAACP continues more or less unchanged. It continues to be a shameless expression of African petty bourgeois opportunism. It is essentially a wing of the bourgeois Democratic Party and functions mainly as a pipeline through which the liberal white ruling class imposes indirect neo-colonial authority over the colonized African community of the U.S. The situation is no better on the continent of Africa. The African National Congress, ANC, is probably the best known of the liberation organizations of the 60s. This is mainly because the struggle against the South African apartheid regime succeeded in winning support from much of the world, and its leader, Nelson Mandela, became the world's most recognized political prisoner. The ANC uh, was initially recognized due uh, to the former Soviet Union's designation of the organization as one of the authentic six revolutionary groups on the continent during that period. The, political influence, the politically influential Soviet Union did much uh, to win support for the ANC throughout the world. Later in 1994, when apartheid was no longer viable because of mass resistance and the Soviet Union no longer existed, Mandela was release, released from prison through pressure from the liberal bourgeoisie of the world. Because a black face was necessary to represent white imperialist interests in South Africa, the U.S. took the lead in world sponsorship of the African National Congress. In the 1960s, the African National Congress was recognized along with the Pan-Africanist Congress of Azania, PAC as one of the two legitimate liberation organizations in South Africa. The ANC was, for all practical purposes, the mass organization of the South African Communist Party, a mainly white political formation that could not fight for control of a black African movement and government with its own white face. Today, it is clear to most of the world that the ANC is not fundamentally different 
from the white nationalist regime it replaced. At the time, however, our party was the only force that was clear and outspoken on this question, as documented in articles from the Burning Spear from the 1970s and 80s. As we predicted, the only thing that, was trans that has transpired since the ANC's rise to power, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> is that a sector of the African petty bourgeoisie or middle class has been recruited to administer the white capitalist state after indirect white rule became untenable. Now in South Africa, there is settler neo-colonialism. Now it is the black government that protects the interests of international capital and the white minority that still owns more than 80% of the land, an area four times larger than England and Northern Ireland combined. Today, the ANC government orders police murders of protesting African miners. The ANC presides over a regime under which more than 40% of the African workers are unemployed in steadily deteriorating conditions, while the conditions of the whites have pr improved considerably. In Zimbabwe, Algeria, Egypt, Angola, Kenya, Guinea-Bissau, Mozambique, Democratic Republic of Congo, and other places where armed organizations led struggles against the prevailing forms of colonial white domination, there is no forward motion. In most instances, there has only been a replacement of white oppression by imperialist-backed black oppression of the masses of our people. However, we are here, the African Socialist International, the global expression of the African People's Socialist Party. We are here, forged and prepared over the last 41 years for the task confronting Africa, Africans, and the toiling masses of the world. We represent historical continuity, the ongoing development of a revolutionary process guided by our ever-developing revolutionary theory. Despite the shortcomings and failures of various expressions of our revolution at particular moments in history, our party has become the custodians of the interests and aspirations of the oppressed and dispersed African nation. It is our existence that represents the dynamic future of Africa and the African Revolution despite the setbacks experienced by the limitations and or abandonment of particular African personalities or organizations of the last period. Political parties are always organizations that represent the interests of particular classes, although efforts are often made to disguise this fact. In so-called democratic capitalist society, political parties often obscure their class character. This is, this is especially true in the United States, where the main ruling class parties are the Democrats and Republicans. These two parties most, of, most often share political power in a number of ways, included, including elected offices, as well as appointments to posts within the administrations of either or both parties in government. Regardless of the capitalist political party in power, each party looks out for the interest of capitalism in general. Regardless of the capitalist political po party in power, each party looks out for the interest of capitalism in general, even as it pursues the specific interests of the specific sector of the bourgeoisie that it represents for its elevation to power. The African People's Socialist Party is also the party of a class, the African working class. Our work is responsive to the interests of our class, interests that distinguishes it from other social forces, whether those of the oppressor nation capitalist or the oppressed nation neo-colonial aspiring African petty bourgeoisie. Our objective is to provide the political leadership for the African working class in its pursuit of political power, the power to govern, the power to become the new ruling class of a liberated United Africa, an African population whose conditions of existence worldwide are a reflection of the rape and colonization of Africa. African internationalism is our scientifically based ideological guide that informs our actions and keep us, keeps us on the right track. It keeps us away from the lures of race nationalism, superstitions, and other toxins that attempt to divert the masses and us from 
our historical mission of African liberation, unification, and socialism. What we are currently experiencing in the name of revolution is the consequence of revolutionary defeat. This is what has contributed to the stupefaction of the masses of our people and the peoples of the world. This is why our party and African internationalism are so important. Our party represents the clearest evidence of revolutionary continuum in the world. It is, and it is revolution that continues to be necessary, not prayer for the right God while turned in the correct direction. It is not that we need cultural enrichment or nor is social media militancy audacity in front of a computer screen the missing element. It was revolution that won the hearts of masses of African people and other oppressed peoples around the world. It was revolution that was defeated and counter-revolution that succeeded almost absolutely except for the presence and work of the African People's Socialist Party. One of the issues that has served to befuddle sectors of the African liberation movement in the U.S. and elsewhere is the definition of white people, their role in history and their place, if any, in the struggle to end oppression and exploitation. This is an issue that has been complicated by the fact that for centuries, race-based ideological definitions have been used by European oppressors as justification for the horrors they have inflicted on most of the world and especially on Africans. To justify the colonial enslavement and brutal oppression of Africans, Europeans concocted pseudo-scientific biological so-called evidence purporting the inherent inferiority and bestiality of the colonized. Africans and other oppressed peoples were the primary victims of the violent oppression that accompanied the ruthless exploitation used to create the capitalist system and the sense of sameness necessary for the consolidation of the European nation. Capitalism entered the historical scene as a world system stemming from slavery and colonialism, and its power to define reality was nearly absolute. What is known as racism is a consequence of the power of capital built on the backs of Africans and indigenous peoples. In fact, racism, as we discussed earlier in this chapter, is the ideological foundation of the global capitalist social system. Racism is a component of the superstructure spawned by the process of capitalism's conception. Therefore, it is nearly impossible to exaggerate the extent of its intellectual influence in the US, Europe, and the world. What is called racism is a biological analysis. It is reinforced by the creation of such things as the discipline of anthropology used for the express purpose of proving the superiority of whites or Europeans over Africans and all others. This analysis had an, had an understandable influence over how Africans would begin to explain white people uh, as oppressors in the struggle to recapture our humanity, resources, and freedom. Victimized by this pseudo-scientific approach, Africans adopted a competing biological analysis to explain the evil nature of the white man. One result of this has been a hodgepodge of theories that span the genetic gamut. This included assertions that the white man is a mutation. The white man's depra depravities are expressions of melanin deficits. And finally, from the nation of Islam, the white man was created by an evil black genius named Yaqub through a selective breeding process. Contributing to the complexity of the issue has been the perennial willingness of the white majority, ma majority to suffer voluntary isolation uh, from the majority of humanity in exchange for the material benefit of imperialist colonialism, as well as the extraordinary irrationally based spiritual or ideological rewards of whiteness. As long ago as 1858, in a letter to Karl Marx, his comrade and collaborator Frederick Engels offered this materialist observation about the ability of the whites to unite with their ruling class in the exploitation of, colonial, of the colonial world. Quote, this is Engels. 
For a nation which explores the whole world, this is, of course, to a certain extent justifiable, unquote. Later in 1882, in a letter to, on the same subject, subject, Engels would comment to Karl Karl Kowski, quote, you ask me what the English workers think about colonial policy. Well, exactly the same as they think about politics in general. The workers gaily share the feast of England's monopoly of the world's market and the colonies, unquote. What Engels has begun to do here is attempt a scientific materialist-based explanation for white behavior. We have spoken to this issue earlier in our description of the economic foundation of capitalism and the resultant superstructure. However, our party has more to say on this issue that has provided such a Gordian knot until cut asunder by the incisive blade of African internationalism. Writing in a history of Africa, a book we have often quoted, Hosea Jaffe makes another important contribution to a materialist explanation for the emergence and behavior uh, of Europe or the so-called white man declaring, and we're quoting Jaffe here, Europe was born of colonialism as the exploiting, oppressing, negating pole that tried always to destroy and assimilate its opposite pole, the rest of the world. It was out of this process that the very idea of a European man arose, an idea that did not exist even in etymology before the 17th century. Before the slave trade in Africa, there was neither a Europe nor a European. Before the slave trade in Africa, there was neither a Europe nor a European. Finally, with the European arose the myth of European superiority and separate existence as a special species or race. There arose indeed the myth of race in general, unknown to mankind before. Even the word did not exist before the lingua franca of the Crusades, the particular myth that there was a creature called a European, which implied from the beginning a white man. Uh, colonialism, especially in Africa, created the concept and ideology of race. Before capitalist colonialism, there were no races, but now suddenly and increasingly there were races. One born, the myth grew into a reality." Unquote. Clearly this and other African internationalist philosophical materialist analysis offer a correct explanation for the creation, power, and influence of the white man. This is the same explanation provided by our book, A New Beginning, and quoting from that. Living in a country built and sustained of slavery, colonialism, and neo-colonialism, the impact of victorious revolutionary struggles reaches down into the gas tanks, shopping centers, and tax brackets of the North American population. There is an objective relationship between world slavery and U.S. affluence. And up to now, the North American population, opportunistically and demagogically led by their stomachs, pocketbooks, and corrupt leadership have chosen the continued enslavement of the world. In the U.S., imperialism was constructed off the enslavement of African people and the near decimation of the native population. This system has been the cornerstone of world capitalism since the Second Imperialist War, which means, among other things, that the resources, the wealth, the near slave labor of the vast majority of the peoples of the world have been the basis for the development not only for the wealth of the ruling class, but of the entire North American society. African internationalism helps us to understand that white people are just that people. And like all people, their actions can be explained by material causes. African internationalism teaches us that key to the actions of white people is the fact that they have lived on the pedestal of the oppression of most of the world since the advent of capitalism as a social system. This is not to state that White people are not beset with various contradictions with their own ruling class within the capitalist system. Certainly they are. However, these contradictions require for their existence the primary contradiction, 
the parasitic extraction of value from Africans and others that constitute the foundation of the entire capitalist social system that has been generally beneficial to Europeans, to Europe and white people at our expense. For white people to overturn the contradictions with the white ruling class they find themselves contending with from time to time, they must end their voluntary exile from the rest of the toiling masses of the world and their parasitic relationship to us. They cannot simply claim to be a part of the 99% as the Occupy movement proclaimed when it suits them to suddenly identify with the oppressive circumstances of the rest of us. They are not a part of the 99%, and it is dishonest for them to make such a statement. However, this is not simply a complaint about the capacity of white people for truth and veracity. The problem is that the claims by white to be whites to be part of the rest of us is an attempt to use the energy of Africans and the oppressed of the world whose exploitation facilitates the extraction of value that feeds the white population as a means of rem remedying white people's problems on the pedestal. Do, do you see? So they would take the energy of the masses to solve their problem. They were not a part of the 99% until they got in trouble. Then they become a part of the 99% and they want to use the energy and struggle and historic struggle of oppressed peoples to solve their problem. It's because as long as you're solving the problem of the 99% as they define it, then you have liquidated your own contradiction with imperialism that has to be resolved for all of humanity to be rescued. In other words, the contradictions faced by many white people today are the result of the crisis of imperialism brought on by the resistance of oppressed peoples who are struggling against the imperialist theft of their oil, minerals, land, and resources. It is insane for Europeans or whites to assume that the 80% of the world that attempts to survive on $10 or less a day would be, willing to, would be a willing part of a struggle defined and, and, and designed uh, for reinstatement of white student loans or retirement guarantees for white elderly. The real legitimate struggle for white people is to commit national suicide. By joining in the struggle for black power and against white power that is representative of the oppressor nation relationship with the rest of us. This, the various contradictions plaguing the world are contradictions born of the ascent of white power. The various contradictions plaguing the world are contradictions born of the ascent of white power. Like Africans, Mexicans, Arabs, Iranians, Roma, South Americans, uh, etc., white women, white homosexuals, and white workers are all victims of capitalism that was born of white power at the expense of everybody else in the world. Yet, white people have always attempted to solve their contradictions with capitalism at our expense rather than in solidarity with us. Progressive, forward-looking whites who are committed to the creation of a new world without war and exploitation have to join in this struggle by the world's majority against white power instead of using inane slogans and opportunistic subterfuge, subterfuge to attempt to win world participation in solving their perceived problems at our expense. Because you can solve their problems and imperialism can continue to exist. Colonialism will con continue to exist. Nothing happens in terms of the changing the relationship of power existing between Africans and white power. We have already discussed the opportunism of the Euro-North American left. It is real, historical, and universal. In East Bay, late to E-Africa, we quoted from the 1907 Congress of the Second Communist International held in Stuttgart, Germany, and attained, uh, attended by more than 800 delegates. This peace was cited in Lenin's struggle for a revolutionary international edited by, this is the book, uh, a guy named John Riddell. The crux of the quote revolves around a majority resolution at that Congress that under a socialist regime, quote, colonization could be a force for, the, for civilization. This is the resolution that they passed in Stuttgart, Germany in 1907 that under a socialist regime, colonization could be a force for civilization. While today most opportunists 
attempt to disguise the self-serving basis for their opportunism, the 99 percenters at this Congress were refreshingly and unreservedly open in their intent to preserve white power on the backs of the rest of us. Let us listen in to the debate on the question. This statement by Hendrik van Kohl of the Netherlands is in support of the majority socialist colonization resolution, and we quote him now. The minority resolution also denies that the productive forces of the colonists can be developed through the, cap through the capitalist policy. I do not understand at all how a thinking person can say that. Simply consider the colonization of the United States of North America. Without it, the native people there would today still be living in the most backwards social conditions. <laughs> Does Ledebor want to take away the raw materials indispensable for modern society, which the colonists can offer? Does he want to give up the vast resources of the colonies, even if only for the present? Do those German, French, and Polish delegates who signed the minority resolution want to accept responsibility for simply abolishing this present colonial system? Surely there are a few socialists who think that colonies will be unnecessary in the future social order. Although we do not need to discuss this question today, I still ask Lederbohr, does he have the courage now under capitalism to give up the colonies. Perhaps he can also tell us what he would do about the overpopulation of Europe. Where would the people who must migrate go if not to the colonies? What does Lederbohr want to do with the growing population of production of European industry if he does not want to create new export markets in the colonies? And does he as a social democrat want to shirk his duty to work continually for the education and further advancement of the backward peoples, unquote. We are tempted to say more, to quote more extensively from this discussion as we have in the in past documents. However, the point is made perfectly clear here. There is a solid, clearly understood material basis for white opportunism that is not limited to the U.S. or to the so-called backward duped white working class. It includes the most advanced sector, communists, who claim to be organized to struggle for the power to lead the world to a new day of society free of oppression and economic exploitation. African internationalism is not simply an in empty discussion dealing with purely abstract questions. It is a theory that has profound impl implications for how we understand the world and our approach to changing it as we must. This is why this political report has become a tome of sorts, to dig deeply into the theoretical basis confounding much of the world, to dig deeply into the theoretical issues confounding much, much of the world. As an organization of propagandists, the party is the tool of the advanced detachment of the African working class used to spread the gospel of African internationalism among the oppressed African workers and all the toilers of the earth. Uhuru. Uhuru, what a powerful reading from the chairman today. It is now time to open up with questions from our audience and online viewers. We want to appreciate everyone who's on with us via Facebook and YouTube, and also appreciate the engagement on this live stream. Because of time, we want everyone to know that if your question wasn't answered, one of our moderators will correspond with you and make sure that the chairman sees your question. We'll go ahead and open it up now with the first question, which, which asks from um, Tacharwa Masimba from St. Louis. And he asked, Uhuru Chairman, can you speak to the accusation used to scare people away from socialism, claiming that socialism is dictatorial, author authoritarian, fascist, and oppressive? <laughs> what is extraordinary about that 
is that Africans living under the most severe colonial domination and have been doing so for the last <coughs> five or six hundred years have to defend ourselves um, uh, against promoting the colonial domination that we're already experiencing. <coughs> the reality is <coughs> that, that <coughs> uh, socialism is simply uh, the power of the working class uh, having uh, now uh, uh, become the state as opposed to the existing situation where the minority uh, white ruling class uh, has constructed a state to maintain the status quo. Socialism is a consequence of the workers having overturned, overthrown the dictatorship, the real dictatorship, which is the dictatorship of the bourgeoisie. And when you talk about dictatorship, uh, what you're really talking about is rule without regard for law. What the capitalists have very cleverly done is to take people like Adolf Hitler and Mussolini, et cetera, and say, see, these are dictators. Uh, because they say dictator is simply one person rule. But dictatorship is simply rule without regard for law, which means that you can have a constitution that guarantees uh, the right of freedom of speech, uh, the right for freedom of assembly on the one hand, and can have cops in your community that will shoot you down for freely assembling on your corner or for saying that you don't like what's going on or saying anything uh, or saying, why did you stop me, officer? Uh, that is dictatorship. That's actual dictatorship as opposed to this thing that they want you to look at a Hitler and they want you to look at uh, somebody like a Mussolini when dictatorship prevails already under capitalism and colonialism all around the world. That's what African people live under. And those arguments that socialism represents dictatorship are arguments that are fostered by, created by, pushed by, uh, uh, by uh, uh, either the capitalists, uh, colonialists themselves, or uh, uh, by people under the influence of colonial capitalism. Uh, what has to happen is there will be dictatorship by socialists, uh, but this will be a dictatorship of the working class. And who uh, will this dictatorship be uh, directed against? It will be directed against the former bourgeoisie. The truth of the matter is that when the African working class comes to power, it is true that the ruling class will not have freedom of speech. It is true that just as you have to scramble every day to try to find a place to have a meeting, uh, the ruling class is going to be without the ability to have meetings anywhere they want to have meetings. In fact, most of the meetings will be illegal because they will be meetings that will be designed to put people back into slavery. It is true that the dictatorship uh, under socialism means that the workers will have free press, will have access to all the press, and we catch the bourgeoisie putting out a flyer, a leaflet, <laughs> spray painting, or anything like that, they will go to jail. Because what they will be about is trying to restore colonial domination over the peoples of the world, and that will not be tolerated. It is true uh, when the workers come to power, uh, the, there will not be an instance where somebody can rent somebody a home uh, or a house or a dwelling place with leaky roofs and, t and plumbing that, that, that does not work and then uh, be able to call the police, call the people's police to, to kick them out of their homes even though uh, they haven't, uh, even though the slum laws themselves have not met their obligations to the workers. The workers will dominate and the bourgeoisie and all of this lick spittles and people who want to restore uh, colonial domination over the peoples uh, will not have any rights at all. We will have fewer prisons because there are so many, so less, so, so, there are so few of them as compared to the rest of, of the world. Uh, but uh, when we come to power, somebody going to jail. That's the minimum that we can guarantee. Uh, so yeah, there will be a dictatorship of uh, the working class under socialism until such time as the power of capital has been completely eliminated and there is no need for a state that oppresses or exploits anybody. Uhuru. Is there anyone else? Uhuru Chairman, yes. Um, Robin Denise Harris in Orlando wants to know, do you encourage us to purchase land in Africa 
for example, Ghana? First of all, I want to really uh, send a shout out to Sister Robin Denise Harris in Orlando, Florida. She is making, uh, uh, she has been involved in a courageous uh, political struggle, this time using the electoral process that has been established for the bourgeoisie to uh, uh, contend nonviolently for, uh, for control of the state. And uh, I just want to send a shout, shout out to you. You've done a, a magnificent uh, job and want to express that uh, appreciation for that. And, uh, uh, and also uh, the fact that, uh, that uh, her candidacy uh, was uh, endorsed, supported by the Black is Black Coalition for Social Justice, Peace, and Reparations. And in fact, right here in this very same room uh, from which we are uh, having this discussion uh, where she attended uh, the electoral school uh, that was organized by the Black is Black, uh, we offered uh, the endorsement of her candidacy. Now, uh, her question was that whether, what, uh, Makeda? Should, Should we buy land in Africa? Well, <coughs> obviously we can't be opposed to buying land in Africa, but I think that, uh, and in fact, in, in some ways it can be good to do that, but I think that what we really need to understand, that simply going to Africa is not a panacea. Uh, uh, I intend, to be in Africa in the final days of my life. Um, but it's really important to understand that capitalism is a, is a global system, and Africa is, is in the deadly clutches of capitalism in Ghana, and all of the countries in Africa live under neo-colonial domination. White power controls Africa today. And that, that we're gonna have to overturn white power. And, and in many instances, that struggle will be directed right there on the ground in these African countries. We just uh, engage, even as this discussion is occurring, uh, in a pre-Seventh Congress conference that's happening in South Africa, that is for the African region of the African Socialist International, happening in South Africa, uh, uh, with people who have traveled uh, uh, mostly from South Africa, from the various uh, provinces of South Africa, uh, to actually consolidate uh, the party in the deepest, most profound way there. We are organizing there. We're organizing Sierra Leone. We're organizing in Kenya. We're organizing uh, in Nigeria, in Tanzania, and Uganda. These are places where we really uh, uh, have some possibilities of, of consolidating the party right now in some places where the party is already consolidated. So I think what needs to be understood is that African people uh, experience colonial domination as a whole people everywhere we are located. And the only reason some of us in Ghana and some of us uh, in St. Louis, Missouri, or Florida is because the colonizers uh, required us, needed us in different places for different reasons. And in Ghana, uh, uh, if, if you're there and when you're there, what you'll do, you walk around every place and you find people look like just somebody you know, somebody you grew up with, somebody around the corner, et cetera, because we're all one people. And uh, there is not going to be an independent solution for us in Ghana or any place on the continent of Africa any more than there's going to be an independent solution for us uh, in, in Houston or Philadelphia or, or any place uh, in the United States. We have a, 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 a we have an international global contradiction as African people and we have to be organized as the African People's Socialist Party is organized and becoming better organized every day uh, as a global response to that. We have to, have, to, have to actually have more than just an idea of African solidarity, but we have to have the organizational cap capacity uh, and ideological uh, uh, unity uh, to be able to wage that struggle uh, uh, from a strategical point, no matter where we're located in the world. So uh, I have spent a lot of time in Ghana. Uh, I love being in Ghana, but hell, you know, so, you, know you will find that uh, true any place on the continent and almost any place where you find a high concentration of African people. Uh, but the thing is that we have to fight for power. And having a, a farm <coughs> or a house in Ghana is not the same as African people having power. In fact, you can get a house in Ghana, still live on the same neo-colonial domination that we live on the every place else. Uhuru. <clears throat> Uhuru, Chairman. 
David in St. Petersburg says, how does African internationalism explain the current situation of capitalist corporations co-opting the resistance of Africans, for example, in the case of Colin Kaepernick being ostracized by the NFL and now being offered a multi-million dollar endorsement by Nike? <laughs> well, <clears throat> Colin Ka Kaepernick, uh, you know, is a football player and uh, he played football not for fun, but to make money. And the same capitalists who hired him to run the ball or toss a ball to other Africans who were running and tossing balls, the same capitalists that hired him to do that to entertain <coughs> people <coughs> now <coughs> want to hire him <coughs> to endorse their running shoes. <coughs> so, uh, uh, so Kaepernick, we were quite offended, you know, Africans were, uh, how uh, the bourgeoisie treated Kaepernick, but Kaepernick is an individual, and I, I wish him well, I truly do. I think he's become you know, not a bad symbol uh, uh, for, of a certain kind of resistance. He's high profile. He's been courageous in the sense that uh, he didn't know Nike was going to say, hey, let's make a book like this, when he, when he uh, almost they took his stand, but when he took his seat and then his knee, he didn't know that was going to happen. And I wouldn't mind it if all the other cowardly uh, uh, football players who have the ability to run up and down fields and, and get smashed into a state of uh, uh, comatose uh, were also willing to take that kind of stance that he has taken. But the problem that we have is not, uh, 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 at this moment, um, not uh, Kaepernick, but who has not said a, a, a harmful thing against our struggle, who has not come out in opposition like some people who claim to be for the movement have done. Our struggle is that Kaepernick uh, uh, was left without many options in the sense that the working class, the African working class, our organization, our party, uh, has not yet attained the kind of influence that, uh, that is needed that, uh, uh, that makes it clear what it's going to take to make this revolution. So. Uh, this means that uh, Colin uh, Kaepernick just got a better contract than, uh, well, almost as good as he would have got, you know, uh, playing for the corporations on the football field, and it's less dangerous, I would assume. Uh, right now, the only thing the white people are burning are, are Nike products, uh, but uh, so I guess it's less dangerous. That Africans are pretty clear about what's happening. I've, I've seen comments uh, on social media, and Africans are saying that, you know, uh, the revolution is not going to be led by corporations and things like that. So, and I think most of us wish him well. He's, he's taken a, a, you know, a decent stance. He's tried to take a decent stance within the limitations of, of his understanding and the limitations of our organizational uh, capacity and ideological uh, coherence. Uh, he's done a okay as a, a person making his living again entertaining white people. The next question, Marshall Villager asks, should the working class use the Second Amendment for community defense like the Black Panther Party? Uhura, I think the working class with or without the Second Amendment should be armed to the teeth and uh, anything you can get uh, that uh, our communities need to be armed. And this, as it, I don't say this casually, and I don't uh, you know, say this uh, <clears throat> uh, in order you know, um, to get any uh, kind of, uh, of uh, response from people, but <clears throat> we live uh, in a world <clears throat> and that is highly contentious. And at this time, Africans are under uh, an escalated assault uh, by uh, white people in general and by arms of the, uh, of the state that call themselves police and military, et cetera. And so at minimum, what Africans need is the ability to defend ourselves. But even that's not good enough because uh, our people defended themselves in Tulsa. And we have defended ourselves against virtually every major uh, uh, well-known assault that's been made against us. But we have to acquire organization, and we cannot be in a state of permanent defense. We have to be in mode to take our freedom. 
we have to assume an offensive uh, in the struggle to liberate ourselves, our Africa, and our people all around the world. So it's good to talk about self-defense, but I think it was Mao Zedong who said uh, once upon a time that in the struggle for national liberation, every action of the oppressed uh, is an act of self-defense. So it doesn't matter who fired the last shot. The first shot that was fired is the one that captured us and put us in slavery. And so uh, anything we do is responding to that reality that we live in captivity. And what we need to do is move from this state of defenselessness or defensiveness and uh, to join the African People's Socialist Party to come to the seventh Congress of our party that's going to be happening in St. Louis, uh, August 6th through the 12th, it's going to be the most momentous event that's occurred in the last hundred years. Afri from Africans from throughout the world uh, will be coming together uh, to uh, reignite, uh, reorganize, uh, pull ourselves together in this, this era of tremendous crisis of white power. Everybody in the world can see that white power is on the defensive and in the United States and various other places actually uh, uh, on the decline. Uh, but their defensiveness and their disarray uh, does not uh, equate uh, automatically to our capacity. We have to pull ourselves together, recognize that we are uh, riding uh, on a sinking ship, uh, and not only are we riding on the sinking ship, it's almost uh, similar to the ship that we came here on in the first place. Uh, we are in the bottom of that ship, and we have to clamor uh, from this ship that's uh, led by, uh, guided by uh, 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 slave masters and colonizers uh, and seize uh, our freedom. That's what our task is. And so just defending yourself on a slave ship forever, <laughs> you know, as it, as it uh, 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 traverses the world, you know, just in a permanent state of defense, that's not what we're talking about. It's not good enough for the slave just to resist being whipped. The slave has to uh, organize to end slavery, to kill a slave master and destroy the system of slavery. Um, the next was a, a comment from Mensa Ajanaku. Ajanaku. Ajanaku, okay. I really want to appreciate the political education and report to the 7th Congress of the African People's Socialist Party. Thank you, Chairman, for deepening this study. Uhuru. Uhuru Mafrika Ajanaku, register for the Congress. I don't think you've registered yet. Uhuru. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that seems to be the last of our questions. Um, There's someone here oh. who wants to, yeah. Okay. Did she come up? Yeah. There are more questions also okay. and comments. Uhuru Chair Uhuru Chairman. Uhuru Kamrat. Um my question is why do you think Africans resist organization or is it just a lack of misunderstanding? Uh first of all, let me just say this is uh, Comrade uh Fofi who just asked that question in St. Louis, Missouri. And she was one of the people uh, who we met, the party met early on when we came into Ferguson, St. Louis. And uh, I just want to express my appreciation to this comrade who has been tireless worker, uh, who has changed uh, so much since we first met her uh, from a dreamy uh, 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 poet, of, uh, idealistic and et cetera, and has really you know, struggled and grappled with uh, African internationalism. And, and she's called four, four feet, I think, one, two feet on earth. earth and two feet in some other spiritual realm. But, uh, uh, but what is uh, actually true today, uh, her feet are planted firmly on the earth. And uh, she has played such an important role in the Black Power Blueprint project that established uh, this Uhura House and helped uh, the party to organize uh, throughout uh, the St. Louis uh, uh, air, air area. So uh, I, don't, I think that Africans uh, may appear 
uh, to resist organization. I think it's mostly appearance because there, is, there are forms of organization that we find in our communities all the time. And I don't mean just like the church, which is one form of organization. Sometimes we can be confused about the church too uh, because uh, we confuse uh, the church too often with the preachers and ministers uh, when the congregation in these churches are African working class for the most part. They are, we, we know there are certain churches that you know, they won't accept you unless you're in the right tax bracket. In fact, you have to turn over to them. You have to give them the tax return so they can make sure that, uh, that you, can, you can make it. But, uh, but there are other forms of organizations we find throughout the African community. The problem is that, that uh, since the defeat of the African Revolution, uh, our struggle has been hijacked by charlatans, uh, by jackals. Uh, by uh, people who actually sometimes come from uh, the working class and end up in the service of imperial white power, whether that's in, on, in these city councils and wards and county commissioners and other entities like that, but, uh, and, and, and often, and too often, most often, betray the people, or uh, the organizations that people uh, have access to, uh, organizations that don't speak to the critical questions of our people. I mean, uh, saying hands up, don't shoot, or Black Lives Matter, that's not what these Africans are out here. They're not running around. You know, you can go to a white liberal place and you can see signs up saying Black Lives Matter. But you don't see that in the African working class communities, you know, and you don't hear that. You know, what people are, are faced with police brutality and violence and things like that, that's not the response. So what has to happen is that we have to wade through, uh, uh, penetrate, uh, our communities. That's why working in these communities is a real thing, not just thinking that passing out a flyer is going to change or transform somebody or the fact that we're having a meeting because we're revolutionaries, etc. That means we have to do the work among our people. And, and this work is something that's not generally done. It's not done even by the churches for the most part. It's not done uh, by the African politicians. There is a, a, a group of people who participate in the electoral process as activists more or less, uh, that is the base uh, of the Democratic Party. 25% of, uh, of the Democratic Party is Af African people. That's who most of our people are, are tied to the Democratic Party. So we have to go into our communities and bring Africans into organization by taking the program of the African People's Socialist Party to the masses of people so that they can see their own interests and so that they can come into the movement and into the work as participants and leaders as opposed to as spectators who can come out to watch and listen to a big shot make a speech uh, or something to that effect. Uhuru. How's our time? Um, I had a phone when I came in here. 828. 828, okay. Uhuru. Uhuru. Um, the next question is from Olafin Akemba. And he says, Uhuru Chairman, how do we encourage African masses to take up our own struggle for liberation rather than relying on opportunistic governments like China who are funneling billions in so-called aid to current neocolonial government regimes? That's an interesting question on two levels. One, uh, a dilemma for even honest forces who want to unite with Africa in Africa is that the only clear representatives of Africa in Africa are these neocolonial puppet states, puppet regimes. And I remember even, I was really upset even when Hugo Chavez of Venezuela was trying to relate uh, to Africa and uh, recognizing the poverty and impression in Africa. He uh, extended help by uh, you know, with uh, petroleum uh, products and things like that. That, uh, but the problem is that what they end up doing is uh, actually supporting neocolonialism, even when they are honest. Because uh, without that support, those states uh, would be uh, driven into deepest uh, uh, states of uh, of uh, crisis and things like that, which uh, foments the ability uh, for revolution to advance itself. This is not a, a recipe for starving the people, you know, starving the people so that they'll rise up or something to that effect. But the point is that uh, what appears in some instances to be 
designed to relieve uh, the oppression of Africa only uh, provides a relief valve for the neo-colonial uh, puppets who serve imperial power. It doesn't matter to us which power uh, the puppets are serving uh, as, uh, in, because they stand as uh, forces that block the access of power uh, by the working class. <clears throat> China <coughs> has an interesting uh, history in Africa because at one time uh, during the revolutionary period China was, uh, 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 was seen as a friend of Africa. It supported various revolutionary uh, forces. It supported the Pan-Africanist Congress of Azania, for example. It supported the, Zanu the, the Zimbabwe African National Union, for example. And there were other uh, revolutionary states that, uh, 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 states that were involved in struggle against uh, co direct colonialism that received aid and support from China. Uh, and that was positive. But China, like every other power, every other uh, conscious uh, uh, entity, had its own interests as well. And our problem is that we need to collectivize and understand what our own interests are so that we can engage with anybody that we want to as long as we know what our interests are and that's what we are pursuing. Uh, in the case of China, China uh, today, which uh, in my view, has lost all uh, semblance of a revolutionary uh, 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 entity. Uh, China's interests are threefold uh, in Africa. One, uh, it wants resources out of Africa, uh, 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 and, uh, and minerals and uh, petroleum, et cetera. China needs those. It's, uh, right. Two, uh, it, wants, uh, uh, it, it, it wants a market in Africa. And this is one of the things that makes uh, what China does uh, different from what, the other, from what the colonial powers have done in the past because U.S., England, Europe, they don't give a damn about a market. They just want to take whatever they can out of Africa. Now, to have a market, it means that the people got, they, that means they want to sell stuff to Africa. But in order to sell something to somebody, somebody got to have money to buy it with. So Europeans haven't cared about selling anything. They just want to extract everything. So now the Chinese will do, have done some infrastructure building and other kind of stuff to uh, actually uh, you know, create some kind of economic activity in Africa, although they have not done this self selfishly uh, themselves. I mean, they, they will benefit from this. And third, China wants the uh, benefit of uh, political uh, relationships and uh, at the United Nations and other places they can guarantee that Africa will vote um, uh, on their side when it comes to Taiwan which is a really critical issue with China has been for a very long period of time and other kinds of things like that uh, and not just that in the United Nations but in other instances so that's that's one of the things that distinguishes uh, how China moves but the problem for us is uh, we have to continue to uh, to build, uh, like those comrades are building in Kenya, like the comrades are building in, in uh, Africa and South Africa right now uh, with the uh, pre-Congress conference that's, that's happening uh, to uh, organize our party on the ground so that the African working class uh, can begin to define, through its advanced attachment, uh, the party can begin to define uh, our own uh, uh, strategical objectives uh, to, to free our people, to take these borders down to, uh, uh, and to uh, recapture our lands and our resources so that they benefit Africa. Uh, so, so I just think that's really important for us to understand. I've seen uh, how uh, the imperialists work uh, uh, all the time to show how China uh, uh, to create in Africa itself, you know, uh, foment uh, struggle against China because the Chinese are doing this and the Chinese are doing that. Uh, and uh, that serves them and that serves the Europe, that serves America, that's contending with China in Africa. In fact, China has the greatest, uh, is the greatest uh, 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 external uh, force uh, in terms of economic development on the continent of Africa, pushing the U.S. and and some of the other countries. Uh, that's one of the reasons why 
AFRICOM has also uh, become so important to the United States in terms of being able to protect its interests uh, against Chinese and even against Europeans because, uh, you know, as these political relationships go, even though most of them uh, uh, exist under the U.S. umbrella, as these relationships go, uh, they can shift at any, any moment depending on how forces see uh, their own interests moving and what their own possibilities are. Uh, so uh, uh, the, the question for us is to build the party throughout the continent of Africa and every place else so that we can define uh, in a re meaningful way uh, what uh, power looks like uh, for us uh, and what is in our interest as a people. Uhuru. For the next question, um, James Bailey asks, any criticisms on Dr. Claude Anderson's powernomics, powernomics principles to build an economic base? I sense the lack of courageousness in our community to fully adopt the mindset. Well, first of all, let me just say that I know Claude Anderson. Um, <clears throat> when I met Claude Anderson, he was working uh, in the office of the governor of Florida. And um, uh, <coughs> I think I have, I, I believe that uh, Claude Anderson is somebody who really believes uh, in black people achieving power. Uh, we, we would differ, I am certain, on what that means and even whether or not the ability to recognize uh, the African working class uh, as uh, the, the leadership uh, and primary beneficiary of, of the movement. But Claude Anderson, uh, as I said, I met him in Florida at a time when I was engaged in struggle and the state of Florida uh, uh, had, I was out on bail of um, prison. Uh, I had been in prison, I was out on um, uh, on appeal bond from prison. And um, the governor of, I got a phone call from the governor of Florida office, from Claude. <laughs> uh, our office did uh, in Gainesville, Florida because they heard that the party was going to have this demonstration uh, at the governor's mansion. And this was at a time when uh, the uh, bourgeoisie was uh, trying to uh, develop a, a, a liberal uh, white person from the South uh, to run for president. And uh, uh, this was their Southern strategy competing with the Southern strategy of the Republican Party that had captured control of the presidency uh, and most of the national offices uh, uh, in the United States. And so uh, the Democratic's response was to create somebody, and, 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 and Reuben Askew was the governor of Florida, and he was uh, clearly somebody they were looking at. <coughs> they ended up with James Carter, Jimmy, James Earl Carter, uh, <coughs> because we tainted Reuben Askew so badly. We did, we did. We, we brought Reuben Askew down. Uh, because he had imprisoned uh, Pitts and Lee, and, and they had been locked up for 12 years uh, for a murder that a white man had already confessed to. And, uh, 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 and then there was this other struggle that happened in Pensacola, which is right around where Reuben Askew came from in the panhandle of Florida, where a highway patrol guy had uh, stopped this brother, Blackwell, uh, and, and uh, 21 years old, I think it was, and at point blank range, uh, blew his head off of the 357 Magnum. And, and we were involved in that struggle and had demonstrations going on everywhere. So Claude Anderson calls and he says that he hears we're gonna have this demonstration at the governor's mansion and he would rather for us not do that. He would rather for us to go to the governor's, to, to the, to the um, uh, capital, you know, building and not to, because if you go to the mansion, that's, that's going to be uh, Askew's, clearly pointed at Askew. Well, we said, look, we don't have time to make these kind of changes that I'm facing these charges in Florida. And in fact, I had to be in court and sometime in the near future. And that's what I'm preoccupied with. So we can't, we can't help you on that. So he says, well, uh, when are you supposed to be in court? And I told him when. He said, what's the name of the judge? And I told him who? He said, don't worry about it, right? And uh, he said, just don't march on the governor's mansion. We had no plans to march 
on the government. We had not even thought of a demonstration. We had not even talked about a demonstration for, uh, so I said, well, okay. <laughs> and I showed up in court and the, and, the, and the judge, I was known at the time, my last name was called Waller, for some slave master that my father and his parents had, had worked for, and the judge started talking about how Mr. Waller, these are different days and different times and you know things that happened in the past were so bad. And I'm saying, what? <laughs> you understand? And then he said, time served, it was over. So that's Claude Anderson. And uh, uh, he played a role um, in, 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 in ending that situation for me. So I, I think he's an honest person, but I, I think that uh, the, the problem for us is not just recognition of uh, the need uh, for uh, African economic uh, participation and development. That is really important. That is part of the whole struggle for national liberation because critical uh, to our exploitation and oppression uh, is the fact that, uh, that uh, we do not control the capacity to feed, clothe, and house ourselves. And there are several people, and Claude Anderson is one of them, uh, making this struggle. And uh, there's the other brother uh, uh, who wrote the Black Power book. Uh, I'm trying to think of his name now. Amos T. Wilson. I mean, these are people who uh, do you know, good work in trying to raise up the uh, the whole issue of economics and economic development, that's a missing equation. That's the thing that made Garvey so significant, not just that he's in Africa for Africans, but he was constructing steamship lands and factories and things like that. This is what we mean when we say the political and the economic one, that politics is nothing but concentrated economics. But it is idealistic as hell to think that you can grow like the kind of economy that they're talking about without having a political base for it and without having a whole movement of people united, not just for economic interests, but uh, also for, uh, for the liberation of our people. That in the ultimate, uh, ultimately is what uh, economic power is all about. It's about self-determination, about a whole nation being able to do that. You have to have a political movement for that to happen. It's not good enough to say by black, we say by black power. And uh, also, so we unite with any efforts that's being made uh, to capture uh, the uh, capacity for Africans to feed, clothe, and house ourselves, but as the working class and party of the working class, we have a responsibility to move in such a fashion that the outcome of this is not the, a replication in blackface of the same kind of uh, economic relations that exist under white power. Uh, we have to have a different kind of social system, the one similar uh, in, in, in essence to what we uh, enjoyed before imperialist white power invaded Africa and much of the world. And it's possible for the people who produce value and produce wealth uh, to be owners and controllers of that value and that wealth and to be the ones who uh, uh, are custodians of the actual society that we live in. That's what we're fighting for. That's what socialism is, Uhuru. Uhuru, chairman. And in this, um, this question, which is probably going to be the last question, Betty Soto in St. Pete says, Uhuru Chairman, you mentioned that de defensiveness alone will not save us. What would you say to those groups that believe that organizing to take up arms without a strategy, theory, or plan of action to govern? Well, I think that a lot of them who are already doing that, that's why we look up at the Every day we open a newspaper in St. Louis, we see another African that shot himself or shot somebody else or, or how that's used against us in cities like Chicago and places like that because <laughs> Africans are angry as hell. Not only are Africans angry, the fact is that <laughs> there's a tremendous amount of competition for resources in our community. Uh, uh, <clears throat> people like to talk about turf wars and drugs and things like that, but for resources, period in the African community where you can't even buy a newspaper in many places without traveling miles and miles to get one. And, uh, uh, and they talk about things like food deserts. What they're talking about is uh, absence of resources. So it's a tremendous amount of re competition for resources in our community. And we end up in directionless, uh, ideologically uh, vague, uh, uh, and organizationally incompetent uh, struggles to resolve that and it doesn't serve us. And so uh, what has to happen is that all of these forces have to be brought into organization. You know that uh, uh, in China, uh, there were many, uh, uh, 
warlords and things like this, organized bandits who were actually brought into uh, the Chinese Red Army. They were, they were recruited and brought into a revolutionary project. And Fred Hampton in Chicago succeeded uh, also in, uh, in helping those Africans who in so-called gang street organizations and to come into a different kind of organization in relationship with the political aims of the revolution. And so what I say about those forces is that I say more about us and what our responsibility is uh, on the ground to organize those forces uh, into revolution and to give direction to where they should be going. One thing that I find really interesting uh, in passing is that the kind of uh, aimless, uh, uninformed or misinformed uh, 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 violent capacity uh, of uh, our people uh, seems not to help their aim at all. Uh, they are expert shots when it comes to killing black people, uh, shooting between the legs, behind the back, uh, uh, et cetera, et cetera, dead center, but never seem capable of effectively shooting the cops who always claim that somebody pulled a gun but never hit them, you know, et cetera. So, um, we have to have better outcomes, <laughs> Uhuru. Yeah. Great. They have to come into the revolution, uh, Comrade BJ. Uh, they have to be brought into revolutionary organization. That's what has to happen. That's our responsibility, and we can't be scared of them either. We got to do just like Fred, Fred Hampton was able to do, like in Chicago, and walk right in there. And, and I remember, and you have to pardon my language, but Fred said it, you know, he said, Y'all just some little local niggas here. We international niggas, you understand? We're here to organize, uh, to take power, to fight against this enemy. And we can't be afraid of them. We have to go you know, where our community calls on us. And right now, even, people approach us on the streets of St. Louis, and uh, they say, I have this fight with this other sister over here, and I'm bringing it to you. They come to us and say, uh, you we need for you to intervene in this stuff so that we don't have to be fighting among ourselves. That's who we are. That's where we have to be in order to make that possible. Uhuru. Uhuru Chairman, I do have another uh, question from Timba Shibanda in St. Louis. Um, and he says, Uhuru Chairman, Ju Julius Molina is calling for a united Africa. Is this goal as the African people socialist, so I'm sorry, as the African people's special socialist party's objectives? Well, I mean, you know, uh, United Africa, you know, is obviously something that, that we want, but it's not good enough to say we want a United Africa. Uh, Julius Malima, by the way, is uh, the leader of the uh, Economic Freedom, let's see, Freedom Fighters, which is uh, he. Uh, was at one time a leader of the youth wing of the African National Congress, and he split with them, uh, not over any profound ideological differences, but had more to do with organizational stuff than uh, where it appeared he thought he should be in the hierarchy uh, moving forward. But anyway, he split uh, with them. And uh, uh, so this question of United Africa is a really important question, obviously. That we talk about it all the time, and Kuma talked about it all the time. And uh, what we've seen is United Africa is not enough. Uh, that what has to happen, you have to say United Africa, you still got the class contradictions that have been uh, imposed uh, on uh, our economy and our relationship in Africa and the relationship that Africa has with the rest of the world. So, uh, uh, United Africa under the leadership of what social force, what class? And we say that uh, we want Africa and we'll have Africa united. Africa will be united, uh, but it will be united under the leadership of the African working class. And we're not guessing about this. We're actually constructing uh, the organizational capacity to make that uh, uh, real. And so uh, uh, that is what I would say in, immediately. And that's why there's a meeting, like I said, happening even as we have this discussion right now in South Africa, where Julius uh, Malema is located, uh, to build the capacity for the African working class to take power. So we're not, we, are, we are unambiguous in recognizing that it's we, that period of time when we can just simply call uh, for African unity uh, can be satisfactory. We have to go, we have to, we have to deal with that, but we have to build the capacity even in that process 
for the ascendancy of the African working class in the form of this advanced attachment, and that advanced attachment is the African People's Socialist Party, Uhuru. Uhuru. Mensa again asks. Out. We don't have time. It's, okay. just, uh, eight, it's uh, uh, 850 now, 950 Eastern Time. Okay, you ready? Yeah, I think we got to take it home. I thank you, uh, Comrade Mensa. I know you're getting ready to let me know that you registered. Uh, for the for the Congress, uh, and I I really apologize for not being able uh, to share that with everybody. Uh, but uh, just the time factor is something that we have to you know respect. This study was brought to you by the Department of Agitation and Propaganda, winning the war of ideas. For your worldwide revolutionary news and analysis, visit theburningspear.com. For revolutionary radio, dynamic shows and music by Africans all around the world, tune in to Black Power 96.3 FM broadcasting out of St. Petersburg, Florida, and accessible via the Black Power, Black Power 96 app for Apple and Android, or online at blackpower96.org. Did you unite with what you heard today and want to learn more about how you can get involved with the African People's Socialist Party? Visit APSPOhuru.org for all information regarding how you can apply. The seventh Congress of the African People's Socialist Party will be October 6th through the 12th in St. Louis, Missouri, and is themed Vanguard, the Advanced Detachment of the African Revolution. A part of this historic event will be the Black Power Masquerade Ball. With live culture, performances, dancing, best dress contest, and silent auction. All info around the Congress and Banquet can be found at APSPCongress.org. Register today, register today and Vanguard up. On November 3rd and 4th, the Black is Back Coalition for Social Justice, Peace, and Reparations will be conducting its annual march rally and conference in Washington, D.C. This march is appropriately themed, There is no peace. Africa and Africans are at war. U.S. to the world, comply or die. More information about this event can be found at blackisbackcoalition.org. December 9th through 16th, come cruise with us aboard the Marcus Garvey Legacy Cruise, a time for revolutionaries to kick back and relax. You'll be on board with Chairman Omali Yeshitela while getting to enjoy the spoils of the ship. Destinations include Grand Cayman, Mahogany Bay, Belize, and Cozumel, Mexico. Get signed up today at uhurulegacycruise.org. This cruise also serves as a fundraiser for the African Socialist International. Uhuru. Uhuru. Before we shut it down, I would like to really uh, send a shout out to all your comrades uh, on the continent of Africa who are participating in this process, uh, who want to participate in this process. I especially want to uh, send a shout out to uh, Comrade Chairman Tafari uh, in uh, South Africa, uh, occupied Azania, and all of you who are participating uh, in the first ever uh, uh, African People's Socialist Party uh, pre-African-based, uh, continental uh, African-based uh, pre-Congress uh, conference there. So uh, you comrades are uh, really on target. It's, uh, we can't say how much we appreciate uh, you young African workers uh, who are stepping uh, forward to uh, rescue our Africa from uh, this uh, uh, horrible abyss that, uh, that the neo-colonial uh, imperialist uh, alignment uh, has uh, provided for us. So, is we late to Africa. I also uh, want to recognize that uh, Africans, uh, particularly in Kenya and Sierra Leone, uh, I know that there are Africans uh, in Uganda and Tanzania uh, who are also, uh, and Nigeria, who are also uh, uh, trying to uh, become a part of the African Socialist International. Uh, which is simply the African People's Socialist Party writ large. It's uh, an expanded, extended throughout, uh, throughout uh, the world. 
they are Africa. They are, uh, I want to uh, shout out to comrades in Australia, uh, where uh, we are also currently building. There is a solidarity uh, movement developing in Australia. There are also party members who are stepping forward <coughs> in Australia as well. I want to recognize uh, how significant we understand uh, your participation to be and how much this is going to contribute uh, to the emancipation of our people and the defeat of a social system that's, that's created uh, through slavery and colonialism. Uh, and also, of course, uh, the party uh, people who are joining the party in Brazil. I want to send a shout out to you, comrades. Uh, uh, we know that you are there and uh, we hope uh, that you are participating in these studies and uh, uh, gearing up to participate uh, in the Seventh Congress in whatever way it is possible to participate uh, uh, in October. Uh, and just want to again uh, recognize that we uh, have an incredible uh, uh, ability right now uh, while the imperialist white power is experiencing all kinds of uh, death throes and uh, et cetera, we have this opportunity uh, to win. Uh, so uh, all of us, the African workers and people who recognize that the future uh, depends upon uh, what the African working class and poor peasantry uh, will do, uh, all of us uh, uh, now uh, have uh, just an incredible responsibility uh, to step forward and to lead this movement uh, uh, because in the possession of the African petty bourgeoisie and other petty bourgeois and bourgeois uh, forces uh, and imperialism in general, uh, they are the ones who are now hold, helping to hold us captive. We have to break free and you are the only way that's going to happen. So we say the African People's Socialist Party indeed uh, vanguard. Uh, the advanced attachment of the African Revolution. That's how you must understand yourselves to be uh, as a part of the party of the advanced attachment. Uhuru.